Just before dawn, bards and Brahmins assemble outside Krishna's bedchamber. The chanted auspicious Vedic hymns as musicians played lutes and drums inside the chamber. Krishna had already risen and was performing his morning rituals. After bathing and worshipping the sun and the sacred fire, he put on yellow silk garments, the palace. Servants help adorn him with numerous gold ornaments studded with priceless gems. As he paid his respects to the Brahmins, giving them cows and gold in charity, Satyaki entered. Krishna greeted him cheerfully and said, O hero, please prepare my chariot equipped with, with both offensive and defensive weapons. Duryodhana lacks all scruples, so do Karna and Sakuni, an enemy should never be disregarded even if he is a weaker. Satyaki details some soldiers to prepare Krishna's chariot. They brought out the car meant for high-speed journeys, which had two great wheels resembling the sun and the moon. It blazed like a fire and was decorated with moons and stars as well as figures of sharks, animals, birds and various kinds of flowers. Worked in pieces of stones, the chariot was covered with deer skins, tiger skins and rows of smell bells. A tall flag shafts of lapis lazuli bore a large dark blue banner embossed with the emblem of Garuda. Krishna's four horses, Sadhya, Sugriva, Megapuspa, and Balahaka, all clad in mail, were yoked with in a harness of jeweled leather. Krishna came out of the palace and mounted the chariot with Satyaki. His charioteer Daruka urged on the heroes and they moved off, being loudly praised by crowds of citizens. Krishna saw by the roadside Brahmins offering him worship while musically chanting sacred hymns. As he proceeded along the city's main gateway, Highway, the sky cleared and a gentle breeze began to blow. The gods, Gandharvas and celestial rishis assembled in the sky. Offering prayers, the Pandavas and their allies followed the slowly moving chariot on foot. The citizens threw flowers and rice on the road in front of the procession, consoles, kettle drums, trumpets and other instruments sounded on all sides. When Krishna reached the city's outskirts, he dismounted in the streets, embraced him. Wishing his success with tears in his eyes, he said, O Govinda, please go to the pious lady who patiently awaits our return, passing her days in grief. She who is ever attached to the worship of the Supreme Lord, to whom fasts and devotions are second nature, and who is charitably disposed to all beings, please offer her our deepest respects, Alice. When shall I be able to render my mother some good? Please comfort her, O Madhava, and tell her everything about us. The last time the Pandavas had seen Kunti was when they were going into exile. She had followed them along the road, crying and stumbling in a sorrow and pain. Now it seemed they might not see her until after the war, if at all of them. Each of them sent her message through Krishna. You this still continued, please also greet on our behalf our grandfather Bhishma and our preceptor Dronacharya, the wise Vidura, who has unlimited knowledge. We embrace with affection of our only Kuru elders our respects and love. You this still gave a final message for Dhritarashtra. Then he walked respectfully around Krishna with his hands folded after this. Arjuna came forth to say farewell. After embracing Krishna, he said, O Govinda, it has been decided that you will demand for us one half of the kingdom. If Duryodhana refuses, I will certainly inhalate the Kshatriyas. There is no doubt of that. Go now, O Lord, and now we shall remain always thinking of you. Everything will be done just as you desire. After the Pandavas had circumambulated him, Krishna climbed back onto his chariot, spurred on by the Ruka. The horses took off as the Pandavas stood watching. Krishna's chariot rapidly disappeared into the distance. A dust cloud rose behind it. And the five brothers stared after Krishna until the dust settled and they could no longer see him. Satyaki looked around as they sped toward Hastinapur. He saw various omens, both earthly and celestial. Lightning flashed in a cloudless sky, and behind them showers of rain fell, rivers flowed backwards, and the earth shook. Satyaki saw 
water gushing out of the wells and fire blazing up on the horizon. The atmosphere darkened and loud rose emanated from the sky, although no beings were visible, although Satyaki saw all this terrible signs. So all this terrible signs, the area around the chariot was mild and calm. A cool breeze blew carrying fragrant lotus petals and drops of water. The road ahead always seemed smooth and free of debris and thorns. They passed through various provinces and were greeted and praised by thousands of Brahmins. The Brahmins worshipped Krishna with offerings of argya and flowers. Beautifully dressed and ornamented women stood by the roadside, ululating joyfully and throwing flower petals and fresh grains. Krishna stopped to greet the people and receive their worship. At the end of his first day's journey, he arrived at Brikasthala, where he went and spent the night in a spacious house offered by the local people. They brought him all kinds of food and drink, and he offered them blessings. Krishna and Satyaki then took rest on large comfortable beds, still being praised by the Brahmins. As Krishna approached Hastinapur, a fierce wind blew. The city was ravaged, huge trees were uprooted, and buildings smashed. There were also other signs of foreboding. The sky became black and there were repeated crashes of thunder. Vultures and crows wheeled crying loudly. Jekylls howled. On the day before Krishna's arrival, Dhritarashtra called an assembly to discuss how they greet to greet him. He had been informed of Krishna's arrival at Brikasthala. Thinking of Vidura's instructions, the old king said, O oh, Krishna can fulfill all our desires if we satisfy him. On him the world's curse depends. He is the lord of creation, the source of all power, wisdom and opulence. He is worthy of our respects and worship in every way indeed. If we do not respect him, then misery will ensue. Let us prepare our welcome. For him befitting the gods by pleasing him in this way, we will obtain the fulfillment of our desires when he arrives. Dhritarashtra suggested that they offer him the best of residences equipped with everything enjoyable. They decided to offer him to Dusasan's palace, which was the most opulent in Hastinapur. The king then asked that various kinds of wealth be prepared to offer as gifts. I wish to present him. With sixteen golden chariots, each drawn by excellent horses of the same color, eight huge elephants with tusks like plows, and hundred virgin and the same number of men sevens, thousands of deer skins, costly blankets, and silks shall be brought um, before Krishna. Along with profuse quantities of gold and gems, let all my sons, with the exceptions of Duryodhana, go out to greet him. The citizens should line the streets and beautiful dancing girls and actors should perform for his pleasure. Decorate the city with flags, festoons and garlands. Sweep all the roads and drench them with the scented water. Tomorrow we will declare a festival in honor of Keshwa. When Dhritarashtra stopped, Vidura said, O king, you are respected in this world as a man of virtue, old in wisdom and knowing what is right. You desire to please Krishna, this is good, but in my opinion you are not properly motivated. You wish to win over the Lord of the Yadavas by offering him wealth, yet you will not accede to his real desire that you surrender even five villages to the Pandavas. All your ministrations and gifts will profuse, will prove useless if you do not grant Yudhisthir his rights. For sure, the all-powerful Govinda will not even cast his eyes upon your wealth. If you really want to please him, do as, do as he asks. Act as a father should act toward his children. Do not bring about your son's destruction by your own foolishness. Duryodhana glanced at Sakuni and stood to speak what Vidura has said regarding Krishna is correct. Kind words and gifts will not separate him from the Pandava's course. Therefore, I feel we should not offer him wealth. Although Krishna is worthy of all this worship and more, he will simply see our attempts as a sign of weakness. Our gifts of wealth while demeaning us will not sway him from his determination for war 
it may even anger him bisma shook his head janardan will not become angry whether he is properly received or not we cannot insult him no can we win him over whatever he desires will happen and we cannot check it by any means our only cause of action is to abide by his wishes krishna will surely say only what is conducive to the welfare of all beings we should follow his direction o king effect peace with the pandavas for this is krishna's desire duryodhana duryodhana his eyes smoldering retorted so i will never be able to share power with the pandavas i have another idea when krishna enters this assembly i will take him captive with his as my prisoner the yadavas vrishnas pandavas and indeed the whole world will be at my disposal we should think of some means to effect this plan so that he will not suspect anything duryodhana had already discussed this idea with sukuni and karna and had already made arrangements whether or not the court agreed taking krishna prisoner seemed to him the best cause of action the pandavas would never dare attack them if they were holding krishna as duryodhana made his full heartedly full hearted suggestions the kings in the assembly gasped the dhritarashtra was shocked and said angry o oh child do not speak in this way this is against eternal virtue a messenger should never be violated what to speak of one such as krishna he is our relative and is dear to us all what wrong has he ever done the kurus he should certainly not be made captain bismas furious voice then rang out your son is on the verge of eternity o king he chooses only evil and never good Although advised by numerous well wishes you follow him on his unrighteous path towards certain ruin he will cease to exist the moment he comes against Krishna who can do anything he desires without the least exertion i dare not to listen to any more words from this sinful person duryodhana Bhishma strode out of the assembly hall in a rage and Dhritarashtra then ended the session and everyone left censuring Duryodhana his suggestion has gone beyond the bounds of propriety surely Dhritarashtra would now see the folly of supporting him as they left the hall the kings and ministers looked at the blind king who sat in silence what would he say when Krishna arrived the next morning after he pleasant night after a pleasant night in a brikastala krishna and satyaki rose before dawn and began their morning worship they left then they left the village at sunrise in less than 2 hours their fast moving chariot approached the outskirts of hastinapur crowds of people lined the lines of miles outside the city all hoping to see krishna bisma drona kripacharya and the other kuru elders also came out to greet him all of them were beautifully attired and filled with joy to see krishna approached he entered the decorated city surrounded by the people along the roads krishna saw arcways and the structures decked with precious gems from the balconies of the high white mansions along the road ladies threw fragrant flowers onto his chariot many instruments played and the brass from thousands of concerts filled the air the roads were packed with people and krishna dismounted from his chariot to pass through their midst Fifty tall and well-armed soldiers walked ahead of him to clear a path through a crowd. As he went along the smooth stone road, Krishna glanced about all sides, smiling at the people. Loud shouts of "Hail Govinda" were heard everywhere. Slowly, Krishna made his way toward Dhritarashtra's home. consisting of numerous large palaces arranged around spacious gardens he was led through the inner courts passing through a number of gates guarded by young warriors holding bows and spears krishna was brought directly to dhritarashtra in the royal court and he immediately honored him with suitable words of praise the king received him with the greatest respect and had him seated on a jeweled golden throne no less opulent than his own Two young maids seven just stood in their side of the throne fanning Krishna with chamara whisks after Krishna had been worshiped with the traditional rites of hospi- 
hospitality. He stayed in the court for a short while, exchanging informal and joking words with the gurus. It was decided that there would be a full assembly the following day when they would hear Krishna's message. Taking Dhritarashtra's permission, Krishna then left the court and went to Vidura's house to see Kunti Devi. Vidura was overjoyed to see Krishna approaching him home. His eyes flooded with tears and he bowed at Krishna's feet. Krishna raised him up by the shoulders and embraced him with affection. Vidura gazed into Krishna's face. I cannot describe the joy I feel upon seeing you. He said, You are the inner soul of all embodied beings. I am honored beyond measure. Vidura showed Krishna into his home and along with his wife, worshipped him with love. He asked, asked after the Pandavas and Krishna told him all the news from Virata. Vidura was happy to hear that the Pandavas were well and that they had many allies. Krishna wanted to see Kunti at once, so Vidura showed him to her quarters. As he entered her room, Kunti stood up quickly and ran toward him, remembering her sons. She cried aloud that she clasped hold of Krishna's neck and shed tears. Krishna consoled her and her tears gradually subsided. She brought Krishna into the room and set him on a large couch spread with white silk. As she offered him argya, Krishna saw that his aunt had become emaciated through fasting and griefing. In one part of her spacious quarters, her he saw Brahmin standing a sacrificial fire, their voices scaring through the room as they chanted mantras. A deity form of Vishnu stood on a large altar, beautifully dressed and decked with fresh garlands. Incense burned on the altar and its pleasant fragrance filled the room. Kunti had not seen Krishna since before her son's exile. Sitting near him on the couch, she poured out her lamentations. Her voice choked with sorrow. Tell me, how are my sons, O Keshava? Those pious boys, even from their childhood, were attached to saving their elders, were humble, kind, and always wished for each other's welfare. But they were robbed of their kingdom, and you and sent to the forest. How cruel is fate! They have brought wrath and joy under control, are devoted to the Brahmins and are speakers of truth, yet abandoning their wealth and opulence, they lived in exile. This has ripped open my heart. How did they live in the forest, O Krishna, after living in palaces attended by numerous servants? How did they survive in the wild? Formerly they would sleep on the best of beds in well-appointed rooms. How could they lay down on the bare earth? Alas, my children have suffered too much sorrow. Deprived of their father as young boys, they had then, then they had to leave their mother and all their friends and relatives. Hmm. Kunti lamented in length. She described each of her sons, her voice rising, falling in a grief. Shall I ever see them again? She cried. Oh, Chuta, tell me how Draupadi is faring. She is dearer to me than all my sons. That noble lady preferred her husband's company to that of her father and sons. It seems one does not necessarily get happiness as a result of virtue, for she is the most virtuous of all women, and yet has had to suffer unbearable misery. When I remember how she was dragged into the assembly, my heart feels such agony. Nothing has ever given me greater pain dragged by the dishon dishonorable, dishonor, dishonorable and covetous, a wreath even as the Kurus looked on. She found no protector other than Vidura. The virtues of the highest soul Vidura are an ornament for this world. Kunti's choked voice trailed off and she ran weeping for some time. Krishna looked compassionately at her tear-streaked face. Even in old age she was still beautiful, her fine features highlighted by her white widow's silk covering her head. She had not decorated herself since Pandu's death, but she still bore a regal splendor and was obviously noble, taking several deep breaths. Kunti regained. 
No, it's not a class. <laughs>